Uh, uh, we're so thankful for your presence in this place. We're so thankful for your healing touch that we can rely on and trust. Lord, we thank you for uh, this group of students and we thank you for everyone that's watching online. And Father, we know that you have a message for us. And we just ask that you use us, anoint our lips, anoint our voices as we just lift up praise and glory to you, Father. All this we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
don't deserve his forgiveness, but thank you for forgiving us, Lord. Thank you for saving us from the depths of hell. We get to live with you forever. It's not like you, Lord. Thank you. Christ, now 
We thank you. We love you so much, Lord. You are our joy. You are our peace. You give us the strength every single day to get up, to live our lives for you, Lord. And we just love you so much. And we thank you for your presence with us, Lord, and your strength. Oh my gosh, I can't even, I can't even get through. I get so, I get so tired when I'm not thinking about you. I get so tired and I thank you for lifting me up. And when I turn my head to you, when I turn my head to you, even if I haven't thought about you for five hours, you say, my child, I love you. It doesn't matter. I still love you a hundred percent. And I just thank you, Father. I think that your word is true and you are just perfect, Lord. And I thank you for saving my life. I thank you for saving all of our lives and let us just to be open to this message. Let us be open to our lives and our will for you, Lord. We want to do your will. And we just love you so much, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Abigail. I think it's uh, page 203 in that Holy Bible. You say that's it? The 203? Yes, exactly. All right, great. Great. So, by way of introduction, I have um, a tidbit of my testimony. Two years ago, the Lord presented my wife to me, and it was in a dream. And that's a little far-fetched for some, but it's the truth. And um, I did not know her. And we did not know each other at all. But two years ago, the Lord orchestrated everything from the engagement to the wedding to every moment thereafter. And if you've spent any time at all with me, you'll know that one of my favorite life verses is Matthew 6, 33. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. So when uh, Charles and I got married, it was not on our radar, and I want to emphasize our radar, to have a child within the first year of us being married. And um, it's a prime example that I don't always seek you first, the kingdom of heaven. But what I think uh, the Lord put on my heart, Matthew 6, 33, the reason that verse speaks so clearly to me is because I didn't always seek first the kingdom of God. And now it's so relevant and so real that any time that I find myself going back to my way of thinking and going back to how I would do things, how I would make decisions. I think about when we said, I don't think children are in our future. But the Lord nudged us. And within two months of being married, Charlie was pregnant. And so in that, a lot of life decisions have to be made. We were super content. We had this little tuna can of an apartment, right? There was a, you walked in a living room and then a few steps over, there was the kitchen. And then a few steps over, there was a bathroom. And then there was a door that separated the bedroom from everything else. We were super happy. We were super content with where we were. Uh, but when the news came that Charles C. was pregnant, we knew that we couldn't stay in that apartment. We were like, okay, like selfishly, we, we could do it. We could make it work. This little one bedroom apartment, no big deal. But 
we knew that that probably wasn't the best idea. And so we started looking at apartments with two bedrooms and we even looked at like, maybe this was God nudging us out of that comfortability and into a forever home, into a place that we could call home for our family. And so I started looking at two bedroom apartments and then I started looking at houses with multiple rooms thinking like, this is it. Not even one week after having looked at apartments and houses, it was like the hand of the Lord slapped me across the face. And he was like, have you asked me what I think you should do? And I got humbled really quick. The answer is no, I, I didn't. But when I did consult God, I, it was like surreal. And, um, and so some of those warriors that we talk about in the Bible are some of our favorite stories now, right? Like last week, we, we talked about Gideon. Gideon and 300 men defeated over 120,000 soldiers. Only by the hand of God is something like that possible. But today, I want to talk about the story of David. And I'm going to do my best to... Um, run through a lot of scripture. So have your Bibles open to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16. We begin, and this is like the Cliff Notes version to catch you up to speed on what I'm going to attempt to do. So in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Samuel is a priest. He's a prophet, and he's obedient to God by anointing the new king of Israel. His name was Saul. Okay, following so far, because we only have 10 more bullet points. In chapter 15, God says to Samuel, I'm sorry that I ever made Saul king. Did you know that God, no, no, anyway, I'm not going to go there. It's going to say like, make bad choices or something. But he, um, it, God tells Samuel to anoint a new king. Samuel obeys God and goes to a man by the name of Jesse who has eight sons. Samuel goes to seven of them, and to each one of them, God says, not this one. And then in uh, chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, it says right there, what's it say? Chapter 16, verse 12. Yeah. 16 verse 12? Yep. Chapter 10? Yep. No. Chapter 16, oh. verse 12. Wait, verse 12, you said? Yes. I said, I think. Go ahead. So he said, and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine and pure appearance in him and some features. When the Lord said, Rise and anoint him, he is the one. He is the one. The one we call David. 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 So, verse 12 God tells Samuel, That's the one. David. And so, out of context, you might associate David with Goliath, right? David defeated the giant, the nine foot tall giant. But out of context, we get this David and Goliath. Out of context, you don't know who David truly is, right? So, in verses 12 and 13, he's chosen, but he was the last one. He was not even considered to be one of the chosen sons that may have a chance at being anointed. When, when Samuel comes over to Jesse, Jesse's like, here are all my boys. And God says, nope, nope, nope. You got to have another son. He was in the field tending to the sheep and the goats. And Samuel says, yeah, bring that one over. 
that little scrawny fellow. And that's the one. So in verse 14, as it goes on, as David had just been anointed, look what happens. Verse 14, the spirit of the Lord leaves Saul. Who's Saul? The king at the time. And just to run through all of these, Saul is tormented. In the next few verses, you find that Saul's servants tell him there's this guy who plays really good harp. Maybe his music can soothe him from being tormented. It's just out of his mind. Verse 21. So David went to Saul. David, the little shepherd boy, went to King Saul and began serving him. And it says there in verse 21 that Saul loved David very much. So one chapter over, now you know who David is. Now you know who King Saul is. One chapter over, in 17, David defeats Goliath. So having known three important things about David, <clears throat> you know the story about how he defeated Goliath, but there are three things that God says that David is prior to defeating Goliath. What were those three things? It says, number one, he's anointed. You found that out. Verse 12, God anointed David before, you remember like Gideon? The angel called Gideon a hero before going into battle. Remember? David was anointed, loved by the current king, Saul. Verse 21, this is all biblical. So he's anointed, he's loved by the king, and third of all, he is an heir to the throne. Because Samuel said, you're the next in line. So all of this having been done prior to the defeat of Goliath. So you miss the entire backstory to who David was. In the world's eyes, David was the last to be chosen by his father, and certainly the last to be considered anointed as king. <clears throat> but that's why God's word is so powerful. All of those who said that David is just a little shepherd boy, that falls on deaf ears to God. In chapter 16, verse 7, look what God says about how he chooses those who have been called. 16, 7. God's word literally says, don't judge by his appearance, this little scrawny shepherd boy. The Lord does not see things the way you see them. People, verse 7, still there, people judge by outward appearance, but God. Everyone say, but God. But God looks at the heart. You are the biggest judge of yourself. You're judging yourself. When you look in the mirror, but God. When you look in the mirror and you see some kind of insecurities, you're judging yourself. But God, you say, I'm this, I'm that. But God looks at the heart. And your heart belongs to God. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of heaven and the imperfections that I see in the mirror, those are the things that will be given to me as I seek him first. Because if I seek him first and he only judges by my heart, that's all I care about. God knows my heart. <clears throat> I don't care about what anyone else thinks about me, not even myself when I look in the mirror. So going back to, let's call it elementary school Bible study, as you know, David, he is the one that defeated Goliath. David, the little shepherd boy who slayed the nine-foot-tall giant with a slingshot. Guess what? That wasn't the beginning of David's story. 
David was three things before he flung that rock at Goliath. Before he brought that giant down to his knees, he was anointed, chosen by God. He was loved by the king, and he was in line to be the next king, an heir to the throne. If you begin acting like you are these three things, giants would be afraid of you. You are these three things. You are called by God. You are loved by the king, and you are an heir to the throne of Jesus Christ. What was David's motivation to kill Goliath? Remember from Sunday school times? David was offended. David was offended that this giant named Goliath was mocking the name of God. <clears throat> David asked, what will be done for the man? I'm sorry. David asked, who is this Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He saw the entire Israelite army at the side. And he's asking his brothers, like, y'all hear this guy? Like, he's mocking God. And y'all are just going to sit there? David was anointed. David was going to be king. He knows who he is. He's anointed. He's next to be king. He's loved by the king. He has all these favors. And David was upset that the soldiers were allowing Goliath to mock God. Fast forward, since you know the story of David and Goliath. Saul is running after David. And I know that that's a, a huge time lapse, but since you know the story of David and Goliath, there are years later, and it's really only a few chapters, but you have to think that it's at least like five years, where David chooses to defend himself rather than let God defend him. David, like Gideon, had overcome some incredible obstacles. And now that he's a war hero, he's running from King Saul. Saul had given David his daughter to marry. Saul's son, Jonathan, was David's best friend. And now Saul had once considered David like a son. Why would David fear someone he had once trusted? David was more afraid of his father-in-law than a nine foot tall giant. Now, I'm a son-in-law, I have a father-in-law, I can relate. But David won't stand up to Saul. David had defended the name of God by slaying Goliath, the one that mocked God. He had seen the mighty power of God overcoming a nine foot tall giant. Why was David more afraid after his defeat of Goliath? Now here's chapter 21, verses 10 through 13. This is how far David went to protect himself. A few chapters over. So David escaped from Saul and went to King Ashish of Gath. <laughs> but the officers of Ashish were unhappy about his being there. Isn't this David, the king of the land? They asked. Isn't he the one the people honor with dances, singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands? David heard these comments and was very afraid of what King Ashish of Gath might do to him. So he pretended to be insane. This is biblical. I'm not making this stuff up. He pretended to be insane, scratching on doors, drooling down his beard. David went as far as acting insane to escape Saul. It doesn't make any sense. We do some really dumb things in an effort to defend ourselves. And those actions often have severe consequences. So fast forward, whether it was one year, four days, 10 days, or a month, the written account of this story Chapter 23 records the first time David consults the Lord. 
Listen, running without God's direction only leads to destruction. Running without God's direction only leads to destruction. What made David so confident that he could kill Goliath? Absolute certainty that no one is to mock God Almighty. Anytime there is someone mocking God, you don't have to consult God to ask permission to take action. You take action. Stand up for God, first and foremost. Stand up for what is right, what is good, what is truth. Without that certainty, without knowing your battle is already won, doubt will cause your confidence to wither away. And like David, you'll run, you'll hide, you'll be fearful of whatever the enemy throws at you. But when you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things, all these things will be added to you. Seek him first in your daily battles. Seek him first for confidence. Seek him first to claim his victory before ever going into battle. Seek his victory. Look what happens when God, I'm sorry, look what happens when David seeks God. David asks, verse 2 here, it says, He inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack them? Again, this is the first record of David asking the Lord for his direction. But what's he said? So he had ran all this time. We're, not, we're unsure of how long that he ran. But he ran, and this is the first record of David asking God, what should I do? Why'd you ask? He says, yes, go. Verse 4. Now, David's men aren't quite as confident as David. So he asks again. Verse 4. Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, Go down, for I am going to give the Philistines into your hand. Go. I will help you. Like I said, prior to this, there is no record of David asking God for help. And on the other side of his prayer was victory. David and his men defeated the Philistines and rescued the people. And Saul finds out where David is. And he's excited. Verse 7. God has handed him over to me, for he has trapped himself in a walled town. Wrong. There's no record of Saul seeking the Lord either. Remember, right after David was anointed, verse 12, verse 13, what happened in verse 14? The Spirit of the Lord left Saul. So Saul, in his ignorance, assumes that just because he's king, that he's going to have a victory. But he doesn't consult God. And here's the difference. David had prayed. The Lord answered David. David learned of Saul's plan and prayed again. This is verse 10. Then David prayed, O Lord, God of Israel, I have heard that Saul is planning to come and destroy me. Will the leaders of Kalah betray me? And will Saul actually come as I have heard? O Lord, God of Israel, Please tell me. No delay. Verse 11. And the Lord said, he will come. Verse 12. Again, David asked, will the leaders betray me and my men to Saul? No delay. The Lord replied, yes, they will betray you. But look what God does to protect David from Saul. Verse 14. Saul hunted him day after day, but God didn't let Saul find him because of that open communication David has with God. David's men did end up betraying him. David's father-in-law was literally hunting him down to kill him. 
And here we have another uncertain lapse of time. We aren't trying to rewrite the Bible, but we want to make it easier to understand, right? So let's call it two weeks, just for the sake of the story. Saul steps away from his men for one minute. The Bible says he relieved himself. And he steps right into where David has camped. Divine? Yes, I believe so. They have this back and forth, but ultimately David says, May the Lord therefore judge which of us is right and punish the guilty one. He, the Lord, is my advocate, and he will rescue me from your power. In maturing, Decisions must be made. Decisions like, should I give him or her a piece of my mind? They really deserve it, right? Should I obey my parents? I know I can get away with not doing my chores. I know I can get away with not listening to my parents. They don't understand me anyway. They're not going to kick me out. You're not always going to choose the right thing to say. You're not always going to choose the right action to take. But that's the definition of immaturity. Not knowing when not to say something. Not knowing what to do in certain situations. Maturing is a process. You learn over time what is appropriate to say and what is appropriate to do. But if you'll learn this lesson. Seek first the kingdom of God. His word is true. All of these things will be added to you. David could have killed Saul. Righteously? No. Impulsively. David's running, being fearful, being uncertain, all could have been avoided. He had matured a lot since he was that little shepherd boy standing up for what was right. He had been in battle, but to hurt someone he loved, to think that he would be responsible for killing his best friend's dad, his wife's father, David would have rather ran. And even though it took some time, ultimately, the only thing that changed the outcome was the fact that he sought God. He ran out of instinct. He hid. He lied. And then he asked God, what should I do? It has to be the other way around. God showed up. He always does. Right? Don't be a hero and try to defeat the enemy alone. Ask God for help. Ask God for guidance. Ask God to resolve conflict and trust that God will do what he's always done. Rely upon God. He has already defeated your enemy. Now, if this were a lecture, I would be graded on how I did. And someone might mention, you only told half the story about when you and your wife found out you were going to have a baby. And here's the other half. When God showed up and humbled me and gently, as only he can do, asked me if I had sought him first in this decision, that's when I prayed. That's when I fasted. And he brought us right here. Yes, thank you. The employer I had went bankrupt <laughs> three months after we had followed God to Lake Erie. The entire world shut down, but God kept us safe. God opened new doors, and God brought us right here, right now, for such a time as this. Yeah. And he will do the same for you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.